Hey, it's me, MLB. Here is chapter 83 of Takedown, and this one is titled At Gates and Caves. After collecting yourselves, you all walked on, slowly making your way from the tops of the bare mountains down to the valley below, the surrounding terrain still remaining just as bare as when you were higher up, but the smell as you got into the deep valley made you wrinkle your nose a little in disgust. What's that smell? You whispered to Magata, sniffing as you looked around. Uh, it smells like... Ugh. You pulled a face as you walked with Magata by your side and Butterfly and On on Agir's back, flanking your left, while Free and her cameraman followed behind. We're almost there, Butterfly said from a little way behind you, and you looked back and up at him before Magata took your arm in hand to get your attention. So the smell... You pointed ahead to something that looked like a white cocoon hanging from a small tree. Is that what's making that smell? What is it? You asked, thinking it might have been a plant of some kind. Magata shook his head as you got closer. You saw a little bit of red stain in the cocoon and something poking through one of the wrapped layers. What is that? You froze, close enough now to see what it was that was hanging from the tree. It was indeed a cocoon, but a spider's cocoon made from its webbing, the kind that a spider does around its prey before eating it. As your brain started to make heads and tails of what you were looking at, you realised the thing hanging out of the cocoon was a limb, a human limb, with blood dripping down it and off the fingertips, and you gasped and stepped back. How? What? I... Don't worry. I think it's just an NPC that got caught, Magata said. Actual players just evaporate when they die. Well, that's usually the case, On said, but remember Pants? She was carrying dead players as well. It could be related to the glitch. Okay, we need to be extra careful now, you said, with eyes still glued to the death cocoon. So now you know what that smell is, Magata said softly. You looked at him, and then it clicked. Rotting. You couldn't finish the sentence, it was too horrifying. While you were standing there looking at him, you all heard a shrill scream from somewhere in the mid-distance, and the hair on the back of your neck stood on end. It was a very similar scream to the one that you had heard on level 19, and you almost had an anxiety attack from the trauma surrounding what happened to you shortly after hearing the scream like that. Everyone in the group was immediately on edge and looked around as the scream echoed off high walls flanking the valley. We're getting close, Butterfly commented. There are obviously other players about. Gathering all of your courage, you clicked your tongue to get a gear to walk forwards, and you all continued on down the valley, getting closer to where that noise had come from. As you rounded a bend, you could see the mouth of a cave ahead, yawning open, and another scream sounded from within it. We're here, Magata said softly. You all stopped a moment for Butterfly and On to hop off a gear, and then you called for him to be sent back to your inventory. Back in the lab, Hansu was furiously finishing up the coding for his USB Pokeball. He had noticed your stats on the computer say that you were experiencing a little bit of a spike in heart rate, but this type of thing was somewhat normal now, and he waited for it to go down before reacting, which it did. Just then his phone rang and he picked it up. Hello, Hansu, the voice of the police superintendent said on the other end. Good afternoon, attendant. I assume that if you've called me, then you got some good news, he asked hopefully. Well, I'm not sure what type of news it is, but we have managed to track down the physical address of the IP address that you gave us the other day. Hansu sat straight up in his chair. Yes, what's the address? he asked. The superintendent gave the address and Hansu wrote it down. That's wonderful, the assistant replied. Thank you for getting that. Now, please do not go and visit the address without backup. It could be a dead lead, but it could also lead you right into danger. Are you intending to confront the person who lives at the address? That was the plan, but it's 5pm now, so I won't be visiting anyone until tomorrow. Hansu lied. Very well. Please call me tomorrow morning then, and I will arrange for a squadron to accompany you to the building. Thank you, Intendant. I'll be in contact, Hansu said, knowing full well that he was going to go it alone. Very well. Have a good evening, and we'll talk tomorrow, the Intendant said before hanging up. Huh. Hansu thought as he hung up the phone and checked the last of the coding over. I'll risk the police taking Gohar into custody or scaring them off with wailing sirens? I don't think so. He completed the task, then safely removed the USB device from the computer and put the little earpiece in his ear and the USB in his pocket. Now I'll have to pay a little visit to this address. He left the lab and pulled his coat up around his neck as he walked to the bus stop and got on, 
pulling his phone out to figure out the best way to get to the address and how to get into the room if no one answered the door. It was a short bus ride as the address was in the apartment complex that was on the outskirts of town, but it wasn't too far away, and Hansu hesitated as he got to the gate. It was code protected, and he waited for a minute, wondering if he should call Hawks in for backup, knowing that Hawks wouldn't try and take Gohar away. Just then an elderly lady approached him from the inside of the gate and he gave her a polite smile as she punched in her number and pushed the gate open. Good evening, ma'am, Hansu said politely, holding the gate open for her. Oh, good evening, young sir, she replied politely. Thank you for holding the gate for me. It's no trouble, Hansu replied with a warm smile. That's not a good idea, Hansu. Stay tuned for chapter 84 to find out what happens.